Hi everyone, and welcome to a new episode of Paratalk. Now, this episode is it's a little bit of a throwback because my guest on this episode is actually a friend of mine. Ben Emblin Jones, who has been in the UFO field for many, many years, I've decided to get him on the show because I want to uh, pick his brains because I've not spoke to him for a while. I want to pick his brains about the UFO uh, phenomenon and how the state of the UFO field is at the moment. So without further ado, let me introduce Ben and uh, we'll go from there. Ben, are you there? Yes, I am, Reeves. Hello, it's good to be on your show at last. <laughs> Finally, I've, uh, yeah, we've been, we've been colleagues on the we've fought my colleagues on the Mindset Podcast, and um, yeah, I'm really pleased that you are or yourself going independent and continuing your show. Uh, uh, your strength to your arm. I'm glad you're doing well. Thank you. Uh, yes, um, I think that uh, uh, I think it was uh, time. It was well due deserved time that you came on to Paratalk because I was been thinking to myself for a while. I really want to do an episode on UFOs and the state of the UFO scene because I've noticed recently that a lot of things have been in the news. There's been a lot of stuff and I thought, who better to get on than my old friend Ben? He knows a lot about the UFO scene. He talks about it. He's he's always on about it. So I thought, well, let's make it happen. But before that, um, for any new listeners out there, could give a, give a kind of a, a rough synopsis about how you got into this scene and where you come from? Well, I'm a former hospital porter with uh, 23 years service at a major teaching hospital. I'm pretty much uh, someone who gradually emerged into this scene. I think I've always had an interest because I've just been actually re watching all of Arthur C. Clarke's Mysterious World. And I remember seeing it the first time when I was a kid. So I must have had an interest in this sort of thing since I was a young child. Yet this it never became a big part of my life until maybe the last 20 years or so. It's something that's emerge slowly over time and today it's it's like really everything i do it's something i've dedicated my life to um it's basically that things such as the paranormal ghosts ufos government cover-ups of various kinds these things that most people laugh at they are real and they're not only real as i've come to realize they are probably the most important issue affecting the, the world today and gaining an understanding of them has become a necessity yeah i, I think that um with the with all of the paranormal with UFOs. Um, I mean, I've, I've kind of been binging a little bit lately on the abduction phenomenon. I've been reading a lot of books on it and watching a lot of documentaries on it. And my my kind of, um, well, not my understanding, but my outlook on it has changed quite considerably. One of my questions I've got to ask you in a little bit is regarding the abduction phenomenon, because I think it's, although I think it's multi-tiered, um, I think there's a very dark element to it as well. I don't think it's just a case of, our, our space brothers want us to give a message to us i think it's a little bit more it's a little bit more darker than that you know um you know we, we could go into that late now or later it's a fascinating subject but you want what do you want to, you said you wanted to talk about it later yeah i think i think what i'm going to do to start with um i've got a, i've got some questions here and uh i'm because I, I want to kind of pick your brains in a in a little bit of a regimented fashion so i think my first question is regarding ufos in general if you think of the, of the UFO phenomenon and you go back to not just Roswell, but further back to ancient times when people would see things in the sky. OK, back then they might have been comets or some sort of aerial phenomenon to do with the Earth. But there were also also things that were written down that just didn't kind of make sense. And if you go forward in time, when we started to, you know, for obviously Roswell 1947 and the first, you know, the, the, the flying saucer kind of thing came became a thing and then. Um, how do you feel that the, the UFO uh, enigma as a whole since then and to, up to today, how has it changed? Has it, how has it changed it, with our society? Do you think it's evolved with us or do you think that it's kind of evolving on its own? The factual basis of the phenomena has never changed. It's something that has been perennial. It's, it's very, very old. I mean, it's contrary to what the skeptics claim. It vastly predates 1940s science fiction films. I mean, it's something that goes, as you, I think you actually mentioned, it goes back in history. Mm -hmm. um, the The actual nature of the, the nature of the actual phenomenon has been the same. And the, uh, the the difference is that it has been interpreted differently by different people at the time. The, the times they appeared, people tended to see it as something other than we maybe today do. Mm -hmm. They, for example, um, 
Andrew Jackson, actually. He actually went on to become uh, president of the, not president of the United States, but I think he was vice president under George Washington, I think. So he was American, he was an American founding father. He described in I think I think it was in 1750. He said he saw a large object and he described it as um, he, he used the words "ship in the sky." Yeah, and on board it were people. He said there were people, but they were not like real people. They were strange looking, and he describes them as having different features to human beings. Yet he used the word "people" and things like this. And he said he saw this object very close up, a ship in the sky with people on board. Who were looked very very strange. I'm quite, I don't. I, I I haven't got the exact quote here. Yeah, but um, the, this is a man who lived long before the modern culture existed. And but but he was describing what he was describing is essentially the same thing people see today. Uh, the difference is that people today would use terms like spaceships and aliens. Yeah. However, the, what they're seeing is obviously identical. Hmm. But the so the phenomenon itself hasn't changed. The people's our culture and our society, our politics and things has changed related to it, I would say. I think the, the 1940s was a crucial transformation of that because that's really when the modern UFO era began. The term UFO was actually coined by the Robertson panel in 1952. Yeah. Before then, it was just called flying saucer, spaceships, things like a flying disc. Uh, today, the word UFO has now been replaced with UAP because UFO sounds too crazy. Um, it's the same reason the, the Robertson panel invented UFO, incidentally. That was going to be another sub question that oh, the, right. the UFO, UFO and UAP has been changed. And do you think that's a um, do, you, do you think that's done on purpose to kind of deflect the way that UFOs are becoming quite like prevalent in our modern day culture? Yes. In fact, um, the term UFO was created by the Robertson panel because the words flying saucer had too much cultural baggage associated with them. And indeed, now the term UFO has that very, very same cultural baggage, which is why um, it needs to be replaced with something else. The term UAP, actually, uh, it, I suppose it's the word used by new ufology. By new, When I say new ufology, I mean really anything, anyone who's focusing on what happened since December 2017. Yet... Um, the actual term actually goes back a little bit further to, I think, this Project Condine. It was actually a British project that used the term UAP. Yeah, but it's, it's very, very obvious that these words don't just emerge accidentally. They are essentially a piece of jargon invented by officials in, within government. So a kind of a, a cultural like conditioning to the phenomenon. So, I mean, it's not. I don't think it's for our benefit. It's more for the, the individuals within the, within the civil service, within the government, within the military who needed to be uh, persuaded or needed to be t taken to take this seriously. Okay, so with UFOs and the UFO phenomenon comes people witnessing UFOs and UAPs or whatever the catch word is at, the, at this current time. So when people see something in the sky and they can't explain it, it's, you know, it's a, an alien spaceship. With people that get this kind of, you know, they have these things happen to them. Would you say that not only people seeing things in the sky, but with the abduction phenomenon, would, would you agree that the abduction phenomenon plays a much bigger part in the whole um, personal witnessing of these craft, these individuals, rather than people just seeing things in the sky? Yeah, if the people who tend to have close encounters regularly are often abductees. The two go together. So the people who have regularly have close encounters will also have interaction with what looks like biological beings associated with these with these craft. Yeah. I, do, I don't know if Andrew Jackson had any, was one of those people, I don't know, but it's pretty clear that um, a lot of people, including people I know, the two go together. I've read uh, recently, I've been, as I say, I've been binging on the whole abduction thing and, uh, people being regressed and having uh, suppressed memories and stuff. I'm I'm going to ask this. Uh, uh, this is kind of a two leveled question because some of the stuff that I've read, where people will say, "Oh, I saw something in the sky," and then there was a great big flash, and then I was in my house or I was walking home. When they they get to have an, a regression session because they want to, they feel there's more that happened to them. They find that they were taken on board a craft or they had procedures done to them that they were seem to be powerless to stop 
and that uh, all the time they were being told, you know, this has to be done, that, you know, that you're part of a bigger picture, uh, or they noticed that other people are there as well that seem to be powerless, having procedures done on them. Well, so m my question is, with, when you look at it from that point of view and you hear stuff like that, I personally immediately get the uh, impression that if there is more than one alien species out there that's conducting a, I don't know, their missions or their, whatever they're doing, well, I, I don't know, but whatever they're doing, I'd start to get the impression that not all of them, in, in fact, maybe a, a large percentage of them, do not have our interests uh, at heart. There's more, the, the, what they're doing is something more beyond, we are just part, or maybe an obstacle, or we are something they are researching for other maybe nefarious means. Mm. The the UFO phenomenon has met, takes many forms, and this includes the, the beings that are associated with them and indeed are perceived by those who are contactees or abductees. There's virtually a whole taxonomy of them now. There's the greys of various sizes, there's reptilians, Nordics, mantids. I mean, there are so many. I say there's a taxonomy. What's funny is that people all over the world tend to see the same things, regardless of their racial, geographical, and cultural background. Mm -hmm. They exhibit a wide variety of, uh, variety of behaviors. They seem to have many, many different agendas. They probably have many, many different origins. They probably don't all come from the same place, planet, stroke, dimension. But um, the, the contact experience varies enormously. For example, there are some people who, are, who for, for whom it's very positive. Yeah. Mary Rodwell specializes in those kinds of um, cases. She's a researcher from Australia. And um, others, there are some, and it's a minority, luckily, where people complain that their experience was very unpleasant, involved very painful and undignified procedures. Some people suffer from injuries. There's been several deaths associated with these kinds of experiences, and including also the loss of children, the loss of uh, the loss of fetuses from pregnant women, things like this. The the majority of for the majority of the um, cases, it appears they describe really it appears to be as you say some kind of research. Yeah, it's they seem to be neutral, detached observers, and it's almost like they are humans. The way humans go into the jungle and they may capture a monkey or something and then do a few tests on it, take some blood, that sort of thing, then let it go. But there is it's not all love and light. There are there do seem to be some that mean us harm. I'm glad they're not the majority because we'd be in big trouble if they were, <laughs> but they do exist. I mean, I say we'd be in big trouble because it appears that the, um, the, uh, the leaders, the national leaders, political leaders appear to be powerless to do anything to stop this. And there's all kinds of rumors that old oh, Eisenhower did a deal with them or something. And so that oh, we will leave you alone. You just take all the abductees. If you want, you just give us the secret technology. Uh, I think if any negotiation between aliens and humans, humans wouldn't really have much to bring to the table. No, they, they don't. The, the aliens don't appear to need uh, to need our cooperation. They've been doing this for a long time. Again, as with sightings of UFOs, this is a perennial phenomenon that seems to have accompanied human beings throughout history. They use different terminology. They may have called it being spirited away by the fairies. They wouldn't have used the word aliens, but they are talking essentially about the same experiences when you look at the descriptions of what happens. And um, there's every reason to believe that people were being contacted and taken like this in prehistoric times. So it's a big mystery. Yeah, I think it is real. There is object. It's not just, I mean, there's skeptics trying to explain it as, various psychological phenomena and none of those explanations adds up i think what do you um what are your thoughts on hypnosis and regression when it comes to uh the abduction phenomenon do you do you think that it's a uh, a valid tool do you think that i mean because there are cases out there where people have had crazy recall on things that have happened to them and sometimes so crazy that you think well this can't be true and yet some individuals that have had this done, they've got no interest in the UFO phenomenon. They don't watch science fiction. They hardly watch any television yet. They are recalling, recalling all of this stuff that has happened to them. Do you, do you think it's a, a valid tool or do you think that some people can use it for uh, misinterpret? I think is the right word. Yeah, I'm, I myself am not an expert in this kind of field. I'm not, I don't have any firsthand information on hypnosis. It's something I've never studied. I've talked to many people who use it. Uh, I've talked to many people who have had who found it valid. Mary Rodwell, who I mentioned earlier, uses hypnotic regression with her clients. 
She's uh, talk, spoken a lot about the methods she uses, about the training she's had, about how to, to, she believes she can do it properly without inserting messages into people's reports and into people's and giving people false memories, which is what the skeptics claim. She claims she, she, she does it correctly where that doesn't happen. All the information has been given by her patients. Now, um, I know some, some organizations such as Bufora, the British UFO Research Association, will not use hypnotic regression. Mm. Um, others, as I say, speak very highly of it. A lot of my friends have used it. I'm considering it myself. Um, but um, the, the, the thing about it is, it is some people use it literally, as I think you explained it very well, they don't have an interest in this. Mm. They've had an experience, and this is kind of a last resort for them. For example, if someone, for example, Whitley Strieber, who was an American man who uh, did have hypnotic regression, he was a guy who was he was living a successful life. He was an established writer. He was a novelist, and um, he had um, what you might call the abduction experiences. That is, missing time, strange marks on his body, weird dreams, thoughts and feelings that were changing, things like this, and um, and a lot of the post-abduction. Uh, syndrome as well where you know dogs would growl at him cats would hiss at him things like that he had um, a hypnotic regression through a proper therapist and um he did recall being taken to a strange to a strange craft and meeting strange aliens and this is something that's happened again and again and again with different people yeah and they, they, very often they come they, they some of them are almost begging for some kind of hypnotic regression to explain how as you said they went out for a walk for half an hour and they came back two hours later. Yeah. And they had no idea of where they had been. And that's right, especially when you have marks on your body and things like that. That's that's scary. And if I was in that position, I certainly would um, consider it as, as it, because it could be there. What other alternative is there? How else do you get those memories back? We talked about um, just just a short moment ago, we talked about the government and the, the role that they play or well. So, well, I suppose the role they play in the the phenomenon, and uh, maybe if you know there was some form of negotiation with extraterrestrials, uh, the, the the negotiations would be very one sided. But uh, what what kind of role do you think that in today's society, what kind of role do you think that the governments of and and the political leaders of the world play in? I suppose in a way, I, I don't want to use the word suppressing, but they kind of. Uh, keeping it out of the limelight i mean because yeah. we've got this kind of we, we've got this kind of um pendulum effect at the moment where there are individuals that are now talking about we've always had individuals that are talking about the ufo scene and what's happening who are alleged whistleblowers but it's getting more it's getting more sort of um uh, you know more sort of out there at the moment and a lot of people are talking about some crazy stuff and do you think that the government's is maybe letting this happen for a reason? Mm, there's there's a few different points you made there. Um, the role they play is is interesting because I believe they they have some kind of physical they have some kind of decisive physical evidence. Okay. And in the terms of you people were referred to Roswell, um, the Roswell incident. That's just one of many in which uh, physical evidence has been gathered, which is uh, indisputable. And indeed, these this has been kept from us. There is a policy in place. Or there has been certainly from for 70 years, from at least 1947 to 19, 2017, in which this was completely and utterly ignored and suppressed and treated as a as a joke by the media, deliberately, because they didn't the uh, political the political classes of this world do not want the general public to know. That this exists, this this phenomenon exists, and there's many many different reasons for that. It's a complicated business. Since 2017, that something has changed. In December 2017, when the ATIP uh, news reports were released, there was a distinct shift in the way the uh, the media deals with this, the way it, 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 people are brought on, people are um, briefed into the subject. Now, the reason for that is. There's many, many different ideas about why that happened. There's been a lot of conflict between different people who have different ideas about what's going on. Some people say, this is it. This is a disclosure. It's happening. It's being done slowly so it doesn't shock people too much. That is where the government, you know, they hold up their hands and said, okay, yeah, we're being visited by aliens. It's real. And we've known about it for all this time. That's uh, what some people say. Others say, no, no, this is just a deeper part of the cover-up. 
people like uh, Chris Mellon and Lou Elizondo, they are shills, they're government agents. They're just burying the secret even deeper. Yeah. And the the arguments that these different sides bring to bear are very interesting. I've been studying them very, very closely. And what's the second part of the question you said? My other uh, part of the question was the, the governments that we're, you know, we're kind of, we're kind of at a point now where a lot of society has become very distrusting of of the political leaders and the governments mm. of the world, and they they t- they tell you one thing, and if they tell you one thing, it's usually they're going to do the opposite. And um, with the UFO phenomenon, we've been told, you know, that there's there's this is the footage we've got this you know film and we've got these documents and stuff's being released, but it's still being released in a sense that it's been incredibly there's so much redaction in it it's all edited it's all it's all censored so i you're not really going you're not really going any further you're only getting what they're giving you on a plate the odd documentary gets um made you know and people think oh this is going to be the documentary that you know breaks the camel's back sort of thing but we don't seem to be moving forward uh with a i suppose a form of disclosure you could argue uh, that that disclosure had happened a long time ago. It happened when Steven Spielberg made Close Encounters. That was the start, or maybe maybe something else. Maybe other films mm-hmm. like that. That's a form of soft disclosure where people are being conditioned to accept a certain thing. But the thing is that what do you think? If gov- like you just said, if governments turned around tomorrow and gave a full disclosure, said everything, this is what it is. You know, there was life on Mars or whatever, and these are the a. How do you think that? That, that society as a whole, how do you think they would react? Well, I'm sure this is these are the very questions that have been whispered in secret boardrooms and um, the basements under the White House and things like this. They, we actually have a bit of a clue from the Brookings Institution. Uh, this was the report was released at the start of the space program in, in 1959. It was published. It was shared with uh, both the Soviet Space Agency and NASA. And it talks about the, the, as you just said, the cultural, psychological and societal impacts of the discovery of intelligent extraterrestrial life. It doesn't, it's, it mentions, for example, it doesn't specifically mention flying saucers, but it does specifically mention artificial structures on the moon and the planets. Yeah. What, what would be done? And it doesn't actually, again, it's, it's very vague. It doesn't say you should cover this up, but it does say, that in the event, I don't remember the exact quote, but in the event that these things were discovered, there would be a tr- massive transformation of people's attitudes. There would be a cultural revolution as a result of this. And um, certain institutions such as the church uh, very, and um, things like that may suffer. They, they may be, there may be problems with governments maintaining the role that they do in our lives. To throw a little bit of a spanner in the works, maybe that scenario that you just uh, described Say that did come true. Powers that be uh, around the world uh, kind of admitted that there is, you know, that our space brothers are here. But maybe our space brothers who are here, um, they're not as friendly as you thought they were. Could I make a shameless plug right now? That's fine. Yes, yeah. go ahead. Um, in my uh, in my book, uh, Roswell Rising, a novel of disclosure, ten pounds, all good bookshops. And its two sequels, Roswell Revealed, A World After Disclosure, and Roswell Redeemed, Humanity After Disclosure. I, cre- I created a fictional scenario. It's a novel, as I said. It's a trilogy of novels it, on this very subject. What would happen if we got the truth instead of the lies? Um, and this is, the, this is an interesting point because people, you can't just give a little bit of information about this. You can't just say, yeah, aliens are real. People will demand more. They'll want to know more and more. They'll want to know as much as possible about this phenomenon. And which means if the government say, yeah, we'll tell you aliens are real, we're, gonna, we're still going to keep this bit classified. Yeah. It's not going to go down very well. That's going diff- to be a difficult situation to maintain in terms of uh, public relations. Um, it's possible that there, some of the bad ones, or for example, the ones that do take people and do harmful things, the whole abduction thing itself is a frightening it's a frightening concept because it means that people are take, being taken without their consent, and they're very in many cases they're going through experiences they'd rather not go through. Yeah, and in some cases it is harmful. It is har- It is upsetting. It's it's um, devast- it devastates people's lives physically and mentally. Yeah, 
And the government is going to have to say, I'm sorry, there's absolutely nothing we can do to stop this. We can't help you. They're going to keep doing this and we can't stop them. And no, no government likes to admit that. I, I, I was going to say, I was just wanted to add to that, that um, my uh, first red flag for me would be if if that scenario did happen, then I think that the 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 greater public of the world would start to say, well, if these these beings are here and they have all these powers, then can you cure my grandma of cancer? Can you yeah. do this? Can we uh get can we get rid of world hunger? Can we uh, stop using fossil fuels? Um, we want you know we want a box in our garden that is makes magic energy. I think that there'll be a lot of demands. People will want, um, you know, they'll want a lot of things from them. If I kind of liken it to someone that goes to a, uh, comes from a an advanced, you know, society and goes to a, a place where people maybe live off the land. They don't need all of the trappings that maybe we have. Yet to them, we are still a novelty. They look at oh, he's got look at the watch he's got on, or look at the phone he's got, and it's it's it, to them it's. It's something that we have, but they don't need need it. But if it was of benefit to them, then they would most probably want us to use it to help them. And I, I think that there's mm. a there in there lies the issue of maybe why those powers around the world don't want, if that is the case, because they want that for themselves. Yeah, this is especially this would especially be relevant if, for example, when the Roswell incident happened and other similar events. The uh, secret government laboratories actually studied this physical debris, this physical evidence, this debris, and maybe develop, maybe back engineered some of the technology, mm -hmm. which is exactly what you say, the, the cure for cancer, the ability to have a little box, which gives you continuous energy without fossil fuels, without environmental damage, without poverty, that kind of thing. Um, if that were the case, then the government would have dug itself into an awfully deep hole. And it'd be, very, it'd be very difficult to for a spin doctor to explain explain that out away. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Um, so this is another reason. Now, this, is, this comes on to another possibility, which I think is unfortunately probably the most likely scenario. There's only one way. If I was a, thinking to myself, I was a, some kind of speech writer or something within the government. And the, all governments have these kinds of people, you know, usually trained psychologists. What would I do? What, well, probably what I would say is, look, the aliens are there. They're all they're all nasty. We are facing a potential invasion. Uh, we didn't tell you earlier on, earlier on because we didn't want to panic you. Sorry about that, but it's because they're bad guys and we're facing an invasion. What we need to do now is you need to give us more taxes. We need to build. We need to build, rebuild up this space force that's just started, and to protect ourselves from these evil aliens. Now, if they say that, if they kind of. They kind of solve they kind of solve the other problem, don't they? Because yeah. then they can. It's this is the kind of thing the government would do. They'd say there's a threat out there. We're here to protect you. In other words, raising their profile from nasty curmudgeons who kept this secret from us to our saviors. And yeah. they may well say this, whether whatever the nature, the true nature of the extraterrestrial phenomenon is. So even though I do accept they're not all love and light, if someone from government comes forward and does a speech saying they're all evil, nasty oinks just like in independence day and they're going to kill us all unless we do something i will be equally skeptical so my question to you ben is will disclosure and i'm talking about full disclosure not just a few videos or whatever but i'm proper the proper full-on full disclosure will in our lifetime or in our next gen the next generation's lifetime will it happen i would oh I, it has to eventually it has to and i mean what happened in 2017, whatever the cause, whatever's going on, whether it's whoever's behind it and for whatever reason, represents it represents a seismic shift in policy towards this phenomenon in terms of government. I, I used to when, when it happened, I thought this is it. We're going to get disclosure by the end of 2018. As it happened, though, it hasn't worked out that way. In fact, it has stagnated considerably, I'd say, in the last 12 months. A lot of people are losing interest, including myself. And I haven't lost interest in the phenomena as a whole, but I've stopped listening to the various interviews with Elizondo and people like that because they tend to just, they seem to be going around in circles a bit now. Um, there's been several breakthroughs. I mean, the guy at the Black Vault, the guy who does the Black Vault, yeah, yeah. Uh, John Greenwald, he's very good. He recently managed to get a free a FOIA. He did a Freedom of Information Act and got the 
some of the classified annex of the A the uh, so the uh, UAPGF report released, um, which contains it contains some interesting tidbits, but it's there's nothing in there that's revolutionary, and in fact a whole load of it is redacted. Again, it's this problem with redaction or things like that. So progress is there, but it's it's achingly slow. Yeah, and and I do wonder how long is I do say well how long is this going to take? Well, how long is a piece of string? I, exactly. I was um I I. My, I do obviously. People know me for being into the paranormal and ghosts and hauntings, but I also, as someone that had, a, you know, a, a, an experience when I was younger, and I saw things in the sky which I couldn't explain. I, I'm not going to say that that was spacemen from another planet, but it was certainly some weird aerial phenomenon, and it was just not me. It was my friend and my father that saw it as well. Um, but. I've always had a, a fascinating a fascination with UFOs. I do find that the whole phenomenon is it's kind of changed not changed gear, but it's changed direction a little bit over the years. And that there is a small group of people that tend to be the the figureheads of the UFO phenomenon. And I mean of course, we've always had figureheads in the UFO phenomenon, but it there are it's become more sort of media driven now. And there as you said a lot of those people are tended to repeat themselves now and talk about the same thing over and over but they talk about it differently and i think that the the problem is with with the ufo phenomenon it it changes so quickly and people have experiences they see things and you don't know what is potentially stuff that our militaries of the world have have created through maybe back engineering and they've created craft uh, some people say that a lot of the stuff that's being seen over America, over our country, England, and other, other, what should we say, uh, powers, nuclear powers of the world, are drones that are made in China. You know, it's Chinese uh, uh, hypersonic drones that uh, are whizzing around. Uh, we don't really know anything more than what we can speculate. But yeah. my question is that where do you think the UFO phenomenon and the paranormal phenomenon is there a link there is it does is there a crossover oh definitely i mean definitely when for example in certain areas where ufos appear especially when there's a a, a wave of sightings a ufo flap for example you uh, will find other forms of phenomena appearing at the same time and a great researcher who uh, talked about this was john keel yeah he wrote a book called The Mothman Prophecies, which is so – it's the perfect example of this. This happened in West Virginia, USA in, in the mid-1960s. It is exactly the kind of thing we're talking about, exactly where UFOs start appearing, but there's other things such as weird people like the men in black and other kinds of strange creatures found wandering the streets. There's winged humanoids, things like this, people making uh, predictions which come true, things like that. Another is um, the Randall Jones Pugh, who, who wrote a book about a similar event in South Wales. Uh, about a decade later, where you get these this crossover, this mixture of different phenomena together, which indicates that UFOs themselves might be more than one phenomenon. Yeah. I think some of them obviously are; they do have a physical presence. I mean, there are there's no doubt about that. They are how they are physical objects, but they also have this sort of etheric quality, which um, reminds one more of uh, the ghosts, angels, demons type scenarios. So that's I find that very very interesting. What you said earlier on about um, the media driving this forward is, yeah. is very true. There was the To The Stars Academy. Tom DeLong, the rock star, set up the, the To The Stars Academy, um, which was which held a really, really amazing press conference, in, which is in 2017, which was extraordinary. Since then, there's been a split. I know that um, Lou Elizondo, Chris Mellon, and, and several other of the key figures within that organization have split, and they've gone independent. Um, I know Elizondo is he get wants to get into politics now. He needs to start delivering results because it is it's it's starting to he's just he's starting to get rather monotonous and tedious. You know there are researchers out there, and I don't want to start naming people, but there are researchers out there that I I have much high regard for. You know they make a YouTube video, but they they do it. You know they write books and they research the phenomenon, and that's as far as they go. They do their thing and they keep themselves to themselves. They might do a little lecture circuit. You know they've got to they've got to put food on the table, and yet you have other other people out there that seem to be just solely interested in, in being on the news, being on the television programs all the time. And when I see that, I'm immediately you know my skeptical hat goes on. 
But that's not to say that some of those individuals are just trying to get out there and get the word out there. Unfortunately, we know this from experience, when the media get hold of a story, they do everything they can to manipulate that story so that only you will watch their channel that when they tell that story. Uh, and that's unfortunate, but that's the society that we live in. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I think that, you know, when, when we, we have this problem, we have this massive problem at the moment where getting out there and telling the truth, it's really that hard at the moment to tell the truth. It's, yeah, it is. It's, um, it, luckily, this is very much a combined effort of an entire community. There are some people who are more, I think, more genuine and sincere than others. Um, others, I think, are are looking to maybe create, a, earn a living from this, um, maybe even become rich from this. There are some people like, who are definitely on some kind of ego trip. There's individuals, for example, who, who appear almost cult-like in the way they're behaving. Yeah, they are almost like they have created some kind of um, some kind of religious thing, some kind of um, it's some kind of a spiritual stroke, um, political thing, and. Um, Oh, have I described? I don't want to name names like either you do either. I should um, also want to comment on something you said earlier. Yeah. The what what they are. I mean, you mentioned that some of them may well be advanced aircraft of some kind. Yeah. Possibly using a propulsion system that's not what we're used to. In, in other words, that is some kind of anti gravity, which may well have been invented by humans. In fact, I think humans have invented anti gravity without the help of um, back engineered extraterrestrial crashes. Nevertheless, um, I, do, I don't. There are some researchers who do believe that this essentially explains the entire phenomenon, such as Jeremy Riss of the Alien Scientist. He, he's, I don't know if he specifically said that, but he certainly it's an implication of his. However, it doesn't explain the entire phenomenon, partly through its behavior. Uh, I don't believe that uh, Russian or Chinese drones would uh, be doing what they're doing with the U.S. Navy, m messing with the U.S. Navy the way they do. Uh, certainly, secret government projects wouldn't do that because you you know if you if a navy carrier battle group is on active operation it'll be armed and um in that situation if they do if they do that people could get killed yeah so they wouldn't do that uh, the other the other reason is it's antiquity as i've already explained the the actual phenomenon is so much older than any uh, certainly it, pre, it predates piston and piston engine airplanes, for example, definitely. Yet the the perception of the the factual perception of these objects has not changed. People have seen the same things. There was an aerial interception in 1930 by the Swedish Army um, Air Corps. Uh, these were like very very primitive aircraft by today's standards. Yet what they found, what they call them, ghost rockets. Yeah. Uh, Klaus Svahn, the Swedish ufologist, has studied this in detail. Yet they were perceiving pretty much. Something very similar to what uh, um, the the pilots of David Fravor and Alex Dietrich and these modern pilots perceived in 2004. And indeed, there's some very, very good reports from World War II. There was a very, very careful, very well-conducted study by the Royal Air Force in uh, 1944 over this issue. So uh, so it's not it's not drones. It's not all drones. It's not all anti-gravity craft. It's at least none that were made by human hands. So my final question uh, for this episode is, and it's most probably the hardest question. Where do you think they're from? Now, that is a very, very difficult question. The answer is, I don't know. Now, no one seriously knows. Sometimes they explain. Now, for example, some people who have contact, it's, they don't just get tied down and impregnated and things like that. The beings actually talk to them. And very often this discussion is done is telepathically. A lot of, a lot of contactees say they don't actually speak. We just communicate through our thoughts. But when they do this, they oft sometimes explain where they come from. They say, we come from here. Uh, the classic one is Betty and Barney Hill. Now, this is supposedly, these, this was a couple from New Hampshire, USA, that were abducted in 1961, where they were on a car journey and late at night. This is, these are called the world's first alien abductees. They weren't, of course, as we explained, but they were the first to be widely publicized. Their experience generated the modern phenomenon, as we know it today, of alien abduction in the media and culture. The, uh, cr the creatures they met on board their craft showed them a map. Um, at least showed Betty a map. And they said, look, we come from here. And they pointed to the map. And then this is where you are. They pointed to a dot, which indicates the sun and the solar system. They said, we come from over here. And these lines are the, the routes we travel on. There's many, many other examples of, of this. However, occasionally they lie. Dr. Carla Turner did a big study about this. Aliens actually lie to their contactees. 
Uh, George Adamski is a good example. He's he's one of many in the 1950s, for example, who were told, oh, we the aliens said we come from Venus. Now, Venus is, is a planet. It's, the, it's actually the closest planet to the Earth. Yet the kind of creatures these are could not possibly have come from the planet Venus because uh, in the 1950s, nobody knew what Venus was like. Then there was some exploration. Some probes were sent there. And we've actually found it's one of the most inhospitable places in the universe. It's very hot. It's acidic. And the pressure, the, the pressure of the atmosphere is enormous. It's like an ocean, essentially. No life as we know it could possibly evolve there. Certainly not the kind of creatures that would proceed. So why did these creatures tell their human contacts, oh, we come from Venus? Mm. They deceived them. So that's, a, that's an interesting question. The question is, why do they do it? Was, do, why did they do it? Is, there some kind of, is this for malevolent purposes? Is it to protect us? Is it for some other reason? Yeah. Um, as I say, I that's that's the main question that I always think about is if they're here, the question maybe has two answers. They are from a place far away and they have the ability to either travel faster than the speed of light or travel through wormholes or something. Or they don't need to travel anywhere because they have already been on Earth and they've always been on Earth and that they mm. maybe live at the bottom of our oceans or they live inside the Earth or... There's a possibility that they are multidimensional, that they can pop in and out of our realities when they need to. The universe is vast. I mean, it's un unimaginably vast. The, the number of sun-like um, stars in the universe is too big to count because there's other galaxies and things, things like this. Now, you can't, as you've explained, you can't actually travel very fast anywhere in the universe because of the speed. Causing, according to Einstein's theory of special relativity, nothing can go faster than the speed of light. So it would take thousands of years really to get anywhere in the universe significantly. However, the wormholes, you mentioned wormholes. This is a way that it's been theorized by Einstein and several other people, which would bypass the entire messing around traveling through space thing. Because it would essentially create, um, it'd be a form of teleportation. You could disappear into a hole at one end and come out somewhere else in the universe almost instantaneously. Yeah. Or indeed, go to another universe. We and it's not actually really very fringe to say now that there are parallel universes. In fact, serious scientists are talking about how there are probably an infinite number of them. Some of them are very similar to our own. There may be some in which uh, be beings, you, you and I, beings exactly like us exist, including people with our names and our appearances. There they could be nothing more different than, for example... Uh, That's a real creepy thought. Yeah, one, one little stone on a beach is in a different place. It could yeah. be otherwise identical. Alternatively, there are parallel universes that could be completely and utterly different. We couldn't even exist because the laws of physics are so different. So it's possible that these creatures are, or are visiting us from there, or maybe it's both. Maybe it's both. Or, or, or something entirely different, something we haven't thought of. Well, that's an interesting note to end the episode on. This phenomenon, will people will continue to debate, debate it for forever because until we get a like as we say until they actually come out and say yep yeah, here they are this is them and come and shake my hand we're gonna people are like you and i are gonna talk about it forever before we wrap the episode up what's your projects what are you doing at the moment i know you're getting back into going to conventions and talking and stuff but uh, what what have you got lined up for the for the coming warmer months Oh, well, I am speaking at a, a location. I'm booked to speak somewhere in July. Um, this is the Dorset Earth Mysteries Group. Uh, I'm also hopefully speaking in October at the Birmingham UFO Group. I've just done a really good talk at the Swansea UFO Network, which is available now as a video if people want to look it up. There's lots and lots of information. Anything you want to know about me is on my website, which can be found at uh, Hosp Hospital Porters Against the New World Order. That's H-P-A-N-W-O. Just put H-P-A-N-W-O into Google and you'll find all my websites. I've got a number of them, including my YouTube channel. I do a radio show just like Reeves does, it, which is um, similar of a similar nature. And, um, yeah, I've got a, a blog with some of my fiction on it as well, including my serial and lots of others. So there's a huge amount there. Everything about me I always publish, so uh, check that out. Well, yep, and I'll definitely uh, put your links on the episode uh, notes so that uh, on the paratalkpodcast.com it's been great having you on ben been a long time coming but we finally got there i'm sure that uh in a few months you'll be back to talk about something else um what i would like to do is at some point 
later in the summer after you've done your lectures is to sort of do a catch up with you to see where the uh you know the ufo thing and and thing how things are transpiring but uh yeah so it's been great having you on thanks for everyone uh listening to the episode i hope you enjoyed it and uh i'll talk to you again thanks very much everyone thanks for having me (laughs) 